First of all, welcome everybody. Uh, if you hear, for those of you who were not just keyed in just a second ago, for those of you who hear thunder and lightning, it is, uh, it is not sound effects. This is going straight over my house as we speak. Uh, hi, I'm Kenny Reed. Um, I'm the president of North Sales. Thank you very much for uh, coming to our double-handed debrief today. We have a, uh, an expert panel and, uh, and I think two people who are as excited about this double-handed uh, project as I am which is why we all did it. Um, first of all, before we get into the specifics of what we're here to talk about, I, I wanna thank all the troops at North Sales. We have done, I, I don't even know how many of these webinars uh, over the last several months, kind of since the COVID crisis started. It was a way to, um, to give back, to talk about, to stay um, intact with the sport of sailing and it's worked unbelievably well. Tens of thousands of people have participated in our webinars, and uh, thanks to Zoe and Laura and Bridget and Hillary and all the rest of the troops uh, in the marketing department and North Sales, we really appreciate all your effort because this is not easy to put all this stuff together. Um, for those of you out there, um, I, I've been told to say, and unfortunately my tech savvy is pretty much sad, but hide your non-video participants. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's all I can say. I, I don't know what any of that means, but, but anyway, just, just do it, I guess. I, I was told to do it, so do it. Um, so finally, uh, on to the subject matter. And uh, first of all, welcome to Susie Leach and Brad Reed. And you would think that if you were doing a double-handed webinar, you would only have two people involved. Well, there's three um, because we kind of mixed it up a little bit. Uh, as, as most of you know, double-handed sailing uh, really received a huge boost in the arm by the Olympics, making a decision that uh, double-handed sailing was going to be part of the 2024 Olympics in France. And uh, it's not just double-handed, but it's also mixed double, mixed gender double-handed uh, racing. It's gonna be a three-day, two-night race that's going to determine a gold medal and in, in the 2024 Olympics. And there's no question that that has uh, gained a bunch of interest around the planet by people who maybe thought of it as an interesting um, option to go sailing, but maybe not thought of it as a primary um, part, part of going sailing. You know, I think, I think most double-handed racers would tell you that they've always been kind of considered or thought of as kind of the outsiders. The, the, the solo, you know, the, the solo shorthanded, double-handed sailors have been thought of as the outsiders, as the kind of the crazy people on the fringe. Well, First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to join that fringe, that lunatic fringe, because uh, I am having a blast doing this. But at the same time, there's no question that the Olympics has, uh, has given a lot of street cred to, to the double-handed racing world. And I always mention this whenever I'm asked, because I, I feel like I'm asked all the time about, uh, about double-handed racing as if we are pioneers. I, I put, I very quickly put my hand up and say, I have nothing to do with pioneering shorthanded sailing. In fact, I've, I've never done it my whole life. Uh, and I, we, we absolutely commend all the people who have done this. I, I was asked a ton of times during my Volvo campaigns, why I never did a solo uh, campaign, why, why I never considered doing a long distance solo campaign. And my answer always was very quickly, I don't like myself that much, but I do like sailing with other people. And it kind of makes me feel the good old days of sailing 420s, sailing back when we were kids, doing the bow, doing driving, doing navigation, doing a little bit of everything. And, and it has been incredibly fun. And you know, this is a, this is a fuzzy photo, I apologize, but th this reminds me that I, I believe the Fastnet race, the Middle Sea, the big five, Fastnet, Middle Sea, Bermuda, Transpac, and Sydney Hobart all have double-handed classes now. So that's legit. Um, there's everything, you know, people are making double-handed boats and there's everything between 100-foot trimarans made for solo or 
uh, this past this past uh, fall, the the I think it was the Atlant Atlantique race where. Just for fun, two people jumped in a 100-foot trimaran and did a lap around the Atlantic Ocean, as crazy as that may sound. But boats are being made for, for this. Boats aren't being made for this, too. The, the, the kind of the beauty of this whole thing is you can adapt any kind of boat into double-handed racing. And it, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You just got to, you probably have to have an autopilot and a, and a friend and somebody you like. And that's about it. And a sailboat. And, and that's about it. Now we'll talk about a lot of the nuance here about what I think and what we think, the three of us think, um, makes a good double-handed boat coming up. But the fact is that any boat can be a double-handed double boat if they want. In fact, in most of the races that we've done, there has been a crazy wide variety of, of boats that have participated from, again, boats like, like we sailed the Jeannot Sunfast 3300, which is kind of made for this um, shorthanded stuff, all the way to old, old, you know, cruising boats that are that are literally most of the time of uh, most of their careers have been spent cruising from place to place to place, and now all of a sudden um, they're out on the race course uh, being sailed double-handed. Um, and it also the participants themselves, it, it, the participants, um, young, old, male, female. It's really, it's really brought a kind of a, t to me, a togetherness to the sport and, and, a, and a, a way for the sport to show itself off that isn't just a boys club um, out on a TP52 hiking until your stomach muscles rip out of your gut. I mean, this is, this is different. This is fun. And it's just good to have fun sailing again. I, I can honestly say that. You know, back to the back to all the big again. Sorry for the the, the grainy photo, but the big five races. I, I believe it was three years ago that a double-handed team from France won the Fastnet race, not in the double-handed division, but overall on corrected time and IRC. So, listen. The the fact of the matter is that double-handed racing is becoming legit, and I think you know we always talk about. The COVID world, compared to the world prior, and the world coming up. In the COVID world, there's no question uh, has landed yet another another kind of um, a, a push to the double-handed racing because, let's face it, there's nothing better than socially distancing on a 30, 40 foot boat than than sailing with just one other person and getting out on the water. And there's a lot of regulations in a lot of the different towns around the world. Uh, a lot of different sailing towns around the world that haven't let people get out on the water um, unless you are guaranteed to be socially distanced. Therefore, double-handed racing is um, is clearly a part of that. So anyway, um, without further ado, I want to bring in uh, Susie and Brad. And first of all, um, I need to I need to shout out to my friends at at Genoa. Um, uh, we. You you don't start a program any sort of program without a boat and and the boat we did a collaboration between North Sales and Jano, uh, Nick Harvey down in Jano North America and Glenn Walters up here at Blue Nose Yacht Sales who's a big Jano dealer um, have been wonderful to us uh, and I think the collaboration between North Sales and Jano has been really strong. Um, I know there's a ton of different double-handed boats around the world. So uh, I'd be remiss not to shout out the, the Dalers and the J-Boats and the Benetos, of course, you know, uh, the, L, the L30 that they were gonna do the, the middle sea race with, a world championship, but that got canceled. There's a lot of boats like this that are popping up. And you know what? New boat sales is good for the marine industry. New boat sales is good because that means that there's something new and exciting out on the race course. We happen to uh, fall into a wonderful marriage with Jeannot, but uh, again, at the same time, I can't say enough about all the, all the different big companies who are trying to produce and trying to get into this style of sailing, and it's really, uh, it's really taken off all, around, all the way around the world. So you start with a boat, and Lord knows we had to learn this boat. Um, Susie and I, uh, went down to Florida this past year. We'll get into our schedule in a second, but we had to get on this boat that had more strings on it than I had ever seen before in my life, and I think she had as well. 
Um, but it was a boat that we, we, I understand the pedigree of because uh, the designers of this boat, uh, Danielle Andrew, um, who I believe is, I think he has designed almost every one of the Genos, uh, co-designed with my friend Guillaume Verdier. Guillaume Verdier, I happened to work fairly close with uh, as he was the, one of the principal designers of Comanche, who we built uh, four or five years ago. Um, he's one of the principals in uh, the Emirates Team New Zealand design team. I, I always say, you know, there's guys like Guillaume who are the Bruce Fars of this generation. These are the forward thinkers of this, you know, the John Reichels, the Bruce Fars, the, the forward thinkers in the sport of sailing. So it, it was easy for me to get involved with this boat in this concept because of my trust of Guillaume and how much, uh, how much confidence I had based on what we did. This is a little mini, this is a mini Comanche. You know, that's what I kept telling people. As we move on, so you got a boat, you got a design and a pedigree, and then you got to move on to a crew. And um, we decided early on last fall that the first race we were going to do was Key West, and we were going to start promoting this mixed gender. I, we're in constant communication with the people at U.S. Sailing, with uh, World Sailing, around the world. How do we promote uh, this mixed gender sailing? And uh, well, Susie... Um, I forget. I, I gave Susie a phone call. I think uh, end of December, and essentially kind of early December, but yeah, early December, and and said, "Hey, let's go to lunch." And and we sat down at lunch, and she looked at me like I had seven heads. Like Susie, what what was your <laughs> when I had this idea? What was your immediate response? You know, first off, I was wondering why me. You know, like there's there's plenty of other people out there, but when you start doing the math of it, you have to really find somebody that complements your skills. And I. I think that I had about 10 different people come up to me and say, oh, I was the one that told Kenny to contact you. So <laughs> I have a feeling you'd been asking around a little bit. And, um, but because you are not necessarily the strongest in the navigation side, and I'd been doing that for 10 years, and also obviously I was happy to do any of the sail handling, um, that, that was, it was a natural fit for us. But I, I, I was happy you, you called and I, I did look at you a little strange. I'm like, why do you want to do this? I knew you from the Comanche kind of programs, and this seemed a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but you've really taken it on. And uh, I have to say about the, the, the tinkering thing, making this boat yourself, I would go down to the boat anytime, and you'd be down there, like, fixing it and doing different things. So that's a side of people that people might, not, might not know about you, is that you like to, to, to change a boat and make it your boat. Yeah, well, it, it was, uh, I think it's been a great, Again, we'll talk about how you how you mix and match the people. Um, the person I didn't have to worry about mixing and matching with was my little brother Brad, and uh, we've been sailing together since we were essentially uh, well since he was in the womb. I'm a little I'm a couple I'm three years older than he is, and um, Brad and I are probably most known for having uh, some pretty interesting battles against each other on the on the water. Although we we've won a, we won a couple world championships together and and uh, we've done plenty of sailing together, but it's been a while and the the rumor around Newport was two men leave, one man returns and and uh, and I think we returned not only returned successful but we returned happy and and had a blast and and it was fun as hell having you there, Brad and and did, did the thing did it did this did this uh, work out the way you thought it was going to work out or what would give us your impression? Well, first of all, when you asked me, I said thank you, but um, there's already going to be a Vegas line set up to who's going to push who off the boat, you know, and come back single handed. Um, now I, I just like sailing and I, I was psyched to do it because it, it is something new. Um, I had done it once before. I sailed the solo twin on a J90 with uh, Dave Moffat. Uh, probably 12, 15 years ago. And that was a blast. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I just, the, I mean, the way I look at it, I've been double-handed sailing with Kara. My wife, Kara, and I have been sailing a cruising boat with the kids since they were really little. And that's a lot. That's, that's double-handing. And uh, we're out here cruising right now. I'm actually uh, in, the, in the interior of my little cruising boat. Uh, we're out in Egertown Harbor. And you know, we, we double hand everywhere. So to me, it was really going to be interesting to me to see the sail hand, handling systems, all the different opportunities that you can do with sail combinations 
and working with you on you know the stay soles and the size of the stay soles and and uh, you know all the sail changing stuff was going to be all new to me but i was really looking forward to the sail combination thing um we only got four to six knots of breeze our whole race so a lot of the same sails going up and down we didn't get to reef and do a lot of the uh the short uh shortening of sail uh, but it was really it was a blast i i really enjoyed it and we did we got along except for that one time near block island when you almost took my head off it, we I don't remember it that way, but um, it's probably happened so many times in our lives that that I, I that it just goes goes right over the top. I think you you said stop being so unhappy. I was just pissed off because I screwed up a like some sort of sail change and and uh, well, any, any, as as the many hundreds of people out there who are watching know, uh, screwing up is kind of part of the deal. It's trying to minimize how bad the screw up is. But anyway, we'll talk about that. So we got a we got a boat, we got a team, we got a schedule. This is this was kind of the initial schedule, um, and and now it's time to put the whole package together. And the way I do things is I kind of like I, I kind of like being successful. I don't like doing things half-assed, quite frankly. Um, and you know, now that I know a little bit more about it, I just figure I'd start out, you guys, with with, with a kind of this the key features of a double-handed boat i mean we've sailed between the three of us and by the way i part of my strategy was to sail with different styles of people where susie is a is a a pro boat handler she you know susie for those of you who don't know was her nickname was susie bow chick and she was the bow person on mighty mary and the 95 america's cup um so and and i always thought to myself anybody who was crazy enough to do the bow on those boats and that because there was stuff blowing up left and right all around your head is crazy enough to do anything offshore so susie's prowess was clearly going to be boat handling and navigation brad's prowess is he knows how to make a boat go fast i always say he showed up at bu when I, uh, as a freshman and i was a senior and the first the first uh practice we ever sailed against each other i think he won almost every race and he's just fast so brad so the two of them were such a difference of of uh of what they do well on a boat it was it was going to be really interesting for me to kind of fit in and and to try to try to maneuver my abilities around the skill sets of the other people but there's some stuff that's pretty clear and, and you know, we watched like Susie on the windy race we just did. We watched some boats try to go downwind, windy downwind off the starting line with symmetrical kites and and uh, and and poles and lazy guys. I can't even fathom that. It's just one of those things where I think that you worked really hard to get the the sail. I don't know if you get to this later, but the sail configuration. You've simplified everything, and then we practiced and practiced and practiced. So we knew going into it, even though we did mess up the start, we knew what we needed to do, and it's it's the practice is is invaluable. So the big swept back spreaders allows you to jibe without worrying about the mass falling over the bow. Sail plan. You know the the big couple things is. You, you, a boat. I, I I was asked a couple of questions. People, you, some of you wrote in some really good questions. You got to be able to reef. You have to have a reefing system that works. Um, you know, some of these new boats. We had a, we have a small water ballast system in in this boat. And um, for those of you who don't have water ballast system, I think you got to sail with smaller sails. I think you take a, a rating benefit. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future too. But a rating benefit for sailing with smaller sails because you're not sailing with six eight people on the rail anymore so if you don't have water ballast you you got to think about smaller sails quick um the the cockpit setup we'll talk about that in a second double rudders it's really hard to wipe this boat out if you ever if you're going to design a boat for a shorthanded sailing it's hard to wipe out a boat with double uh, rudders and then we learned you know we, we've kind of learned the hard way that a good autopilot and well calibrated instruments i think susie was all over the instrument calibration but we're still trying to figure out the autopilot side of things. And I tell you what, a good autopilot sure makes your day um, a lot easier. And, and you guys, this is, this is a photo of us coming in, but you just look in the back of the boat, how small that cockpit is. And, and Brad, we tried a ton of different tacking situations, but that tiny cockpit, I think, if you were trying to race this boat with six or eight people, you'd struggle. But with two people, 
everything's pointing right at where the trimmer and the driver is. Yeah, it was. It, it does. It it does make a big difference to have it a pretty far back. It's safer if it's really windy. I'm sure you guys saw it when you had the big breeze. Everything's consolidated in the same spot. Um, you're always near the helm. So I, I could even see sailing this boat single-handed uh, if you could, you know, with so maybe with snuffers on the uh, spent on the free-flying sails. But uh, yeah, it was. It felt like it was ergonomically fairly, fairly good. I mean, double-handed is just. It's if you're not coiling something after a maneuver, you're. It's already too late. There's so many lines, and and they all get jumbled up just like every other boat that we've ever sailed. But everything leading to the same spot. It's an organizational. Uh, uh, element and you know like Kenny said I maybe I bring sailboat you know uh, making a boat go fast to the equation but I'll tell you what I learned so much from Susie in the training we spent uh, almost a month right training the three of us and also Melissa was on board and Glenn Walters from um, Blue Nose was on board um, and really learning how to be a proper bow person and you know that's where Susie taught me so much and and those lessons made me a better sailor. And uh, every time you get in the cockpit, you're looking at the lines, you're getting ready for the next maneuver. Um, I brought a couple little things to the table, like when we, before we tack, you go down to lure, you cleat the traveler, you pull the new runner on, hand tight. Um, you make sure that's loaded for the helmsman when they come over. You, you know, it's anticipating, it's three steps ahead versus the normal sailing that's generally two steps ahead. Um, and, and a lot of that is due to the, uh, the need for organization. And you're really good at that. I, I don't give you a lot of credit for things, but you <laughs> do think seven steps ahead. Us mere mortals only can think three, three steps ahead. Well, here we but, are in the ergonomically correct cockpit, but I, I don't ever remember seeing it like this because our, 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 our yeah. French friends know how to throw rope at stuff. You know, there's no hydraulics, <laughs> there's no nothing. And, and, God bless them. There are there is more rope on this little boat that I could ever fathom, and I I don't ever remember seeing the bottom of the cockpit, Susie. Never that mind. That is clean. <laughs> but as you can see there's still empty cleats back here on the in the main by the main sheet. So you actually removed about three different fine tunes and different things. So yeah, it, it came even worse than than, than we ended. So that's what yeah. it usually looks like. Now that is not us. I just found this online. Uh, I think this is actually cool. Jeremy Bayou uh, sailing on a Figaro, but. Now we're talking, that looks much more familiar. Than <laughs> that versus that, that that looks like the, what we- as Andy, as Andy Green would say, it's a snake's wet dream, mate. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, you're talking about cleaning up all the time. So we're gonna, we're gonna intersperse this with videos. And Susie, you're down below right now because I think we've just uh, rounded a mark and and I'm going, I'm trying to start organizing, trying to get ropes ready to go. And I've just realized that our spinnaker sheet, I think this is, this is early in the piece. Our spinnaker sheet is actually wrapped around the rudder. You know, a lot of this is just trying to figure out where the next disaster could possibly be coming from. And, uh, and Susie, that's all we, I kept telling you, avoid the big mistake. Well, we actually had to kind of flip the boat over for a minute to pry the spinnaker sheet out of the rudder. It's just finding the next big mistake. When you come up on deck and your skipper is like not on the pillar and he's way back in the back of the boat, leaning over with nobody holding onto his feet, you're like, okay, I'm not sure this is, this is not the way it's supposed to be. But it's one of those things where if you just, it, it, it's totally making sure that you can see we've set up the boat with specific things to try and keep the sheets on board, but if you don't take the time to use all the bits that you've done, it it, it goes south pretty quickly. So we've had, we way, luckily we fixed this pretty pretty easily. Um, Kenny had to get down there back behind and, and yank it out, but it wasn't actually wrapped around the rudders. It could have been a lot worse. There was uh, you saw a little key fob around my around my uh, neck. That was that's that's for the uh, self steering um, apparatus, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So so. Boat, crew, um, schedule, uh, practice. You guys have both mentioned practice. We, first of all, I think we kind of enjoyed it because it was so different and new. But the, another big part of it was 
um, guys like Max Tringale and, uh, and uh, Alan Terhune and the other people that I work with at North really helped work on a very, very simple sail package. So most boats, I was talking to Rich DeMoulin, and he's got an Express 37. He's been shorthanded sailing forever. And he's Rich is on the call. I think he's talking about 15 sails or something that they have on board that boat. That, that, that makes my head hurt. Uh, and I'm in the I'm in the business of selling sales, and that makes my head hurt. Um, we tried to simplify this down essentially to the absolute bare minimum, and that's one jib, one number four jib, which I thought we'd never use up until Susie and I used it almost entire the entire race the other night at, in the Ida race. A reaching staysail, uh, a code zero, one full size kite, one one shy reaching kite and a downwind staysail, and that, that was it. And you know what it does? Uh, it, it just minimizes the, the amount of changes. Uh, it maximizes, I, I, all you, see, you see helix. This is a new construction technique, a new engineering technique that we, that we are incorporating at North, on, first of all, on downwind sails, and now we're really pushing it forward on upwind sails, that it just makes the entire range, we can actually design a jib much deeper and with this structure in the luff as long all you need is a strong halyard you know, with a strong halyard and the ability to to tighten the luff tighter than you ever have before it actually reduces the loads on the entire boat and uh, it takes one of these jibs through instead of a six knot range we're talking about a 16 knot range so so we, we use this structure in these sails to really eliminate as many sails as possible. Now, not just for changing, but also for weight on board. We're trying to have as little stuff on board as humanly possible. And um, you know what? It, we're really pleased with the inventory. And, and, and again, how, how simple it is. This is our sail chart. Um, it's still being refined all the time. We work at this. We work at it hard. Susie's really involved in... in, in taking all the data off the boat and pouring it into the computer and coming up with slightly refined polar boat speeds and also polar angles uh, and, and where our overlaps are in the sail chart. So this has been fun. This has been kind of, even though there's so few of us, it's been bringing our big boat mentality, my big boat mentality, Volvo race cups, uh, big boats down into the smaller boat range and, and still using the same technology. And we have it, you know, at North, we do this all the time. We do these sail charts all the time. And it's, it's based off of the VPP of your, of your boat. And, uh, you know, it really works. So this is, you know, it, it, the, one, the one offshore sail that, that we all sail, this is, a, this is our brand new uh, Helix Code Zero um, on board Alchemist. And Brad, this, this sail, whoops. It's a weapon. This sail won us the race, the Ida Lewis race, whereas I think a lot of people were trying to fly kites in that really light air that night. We had this thing up back and forth with the A2, a little puff com. We'd have the A2 up. Uh, it would get lighter and we'd go back to the code zero. Um, it was, uh, this is a weapon. This is, uh, this is a seriously nice sail. Yeah, the, the um, Solo Twin was super light and um, we spent, what I think that we did three sail changes an hour there for a little while between the zero and the A2. And, uh, and, each, and it's not just, I mean, the sail is unbelievable, right? In terms of the way that the whole thing is set up and the, the left cord tension and the, the thing is, it just sets perfectly. But the other thing that you guys have done well at North and using your friends in the, in the, um, in the hardware industry is the furling systems. The furling systems now with the top-down furlers with these old style code zeros, you, you just, they're getting better and better and better. Um, and I think there is a trickle down to this double-handed that came from uh, the big boats like Comanche. Yep. And I think that's a, a testament to everybody who's been working from Harkin to Ronsta and all the different, uh, all the different players yeah. In, um, in the furling game. Yeah, the, fu the future fibers. Um, yeah, the head stay. Yeah. The, the tiny little cable that is built for top down furling is specific to futures uh, 
and it's it's made our lives a lot a lot better. Top so a lot of a lot of people, Kenny, do want, and maybe this is a different webinar, but the way these top-down furling systems work, you know, for a cruising boat like mine, I mean, we're, we struggle with um, a sock and a spinnaker, and and I think this is the way of the future for a lot of cruising boats like mine. Yeah. Well, uh, it doesn't go without preparation, Susan. Like I said, you were uh, you're all over the data. You know, we would. We were logging on board the boat almost every time we went out. First thing you had to do was get the instruments calibrated, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, I have to say that I think that what, where we really excelled this year and this summer specifically is we did spend a lot of time in the boat and it came to be, obviously, Kenny, you didn't have any, many other obligations going on. So it was kind of played in our hand. But every time we went out, one, I was either taking video of what your, yours and Brad's maneuvers so we could learn from that and or collecting the data and then coming back and doing run through chats with you Google on Google Meets to go through what the KND data looked like and and pull out and really refine what we think should be the right angles for this boat because the, the polars that came with it were not exactly what we ended up finding that was working for us. So we made a lot of refinements. It's still a total work in progress because we didn't sail in anything over near 18 knots until the Ida Lewis. So we still have room to go, but the preparation was really key for double handing because you just don't have time when you're out there. A normal navigator can go down, you can see our, our little nav station down there, it's small, but um, a normal navigator, you see the little troll, they use it as an excuse to go down, oh, I gotta go download some new numbers, uh, some new forecasts, but you don't have that chance. So we did a ton of prep for this race. Uh, weeks in advance, we started looking at the weather trends. Um, Kenny, I, I'm to his, I just, I, I can't explain how much Kenny learned this summer, I think, because he learned how to run expedition. He learned how to download gribs. He did uh, routing and Brad learned it at the same time. And it was just a lot of fun to, to take it all the way through that. But I've always had, I've always had, the Stan Honeys of the world. Yeah, exactly. You always had the big boys doing this. Always had staff. So, <laughs> so he was always so excited. Like I'd wake up in the morning and there would be three emails like, this isn't working. How do I do that? And, and it was just a lot of fun that we both, but I think that's really important is that both people have to know how to do all the jobs. Yeah. I mean, I had to learn how to drive better. And, and Brad was great at that because he coached me. And it's one of those things where we both have our skill sets, but you also need to learn how to do everything. So when the other person's occupied, you can take over. Um, we, the one thing that we did do is that we tried to get as much data as done before because you know that when you get tired you start forgetting things so we if you go back to that slide there's you can see there's a, a whole list of on the left hand side there I wrote down all the different legs and if you could go over block or under block um, what those different lay, the range and bearings are so that when you get tired at night and or if the screen's not working because it gets too wet whatever you can just look down at that really quickly and reorient yourself because that's a really key component to so pre-race pre preparation I, I can say that i've never done as much because you're doing the preparation that the sail trimmers would do the rig tuners would do the boat prep people would do uh battery charging Short navigation room. weather everything everything you have to kind of have a mental you know brad like you have to have a mental image of the whole race course before you even leave the dock because there's no time to just kind of stop and rethink it now you when you're when the when the five minute gun goes you're you're busy you're busy the entire time and what i really learned because i've i mean preparation for me also includes seasickness because i've always had a prep you know pre i've been seasick a lot in my life and uh, I, I've started taking Sturgeron, which I believe is, is really good for me, but I couldn't get any due to the pandemic. We couldn't have you know, our friends who travel to foreign countries bring it back. So um, I decided to, you know, it was gonna be a light air race, um, but I mentally prepared to drink as much water as I possibly could. And I started, you know, I, I started feeling a little weird uh, around Block Island when it was really light and lumpy and sails are slatting. And I realized I had forgotten to eat. I hadn't eaten anything. And uh, we were, we were absolute, we were doing all these sail changes and the adrenaline's pumping when you're doing the sail changes. And what I really learned is uh, part of your preparation is food. And um, although we had enough food, you have to remember to eat, drink, make sure that you're fully hydrated. 
Um, and that's, I think that was my, one of my biggest takeaways, the sale handling and stuff that's, that's, you know, you learn those things that becomes muscle memory after a while, making sure the tack lines on this side, making sure the clues, uh, the, the head goes on for outside inside jobs, whatever you're doing. But the other things, the mental game, and this is what I learned the most is the mental game is way harder than the physical game in these boats, especially shorthanded. So uh, you guys both heard me say this probably 10,000 times, but I, I became convinced early on in this is avoiding the big mistake. I, I, I don't know how many times I said that to you guys, avoiding the big mistake. And everybody makes mistakes, double-handed sailing. Every person out here, put up your hand. Uh, every race, we all make a big mistake. And, and, um, it was probably harder in the race that Brad and I did to make a big mistake because it was such a light air race. But in the, in the race that Susie and I did, <laughs> um, everybody made a big mistake. And, you know, Susie, you and I, well, Brad, here's, here's Brad and my <laughs> race. Um, the, the only mistake was, I, I don't know what t-shirt you wore. It, it was really, it was pretty. The only mistake was the weekend that we sailed the race. Every <laughs> other weekend has been blowing a million in Newport. I know it's it's kind of a shame. So this is like 20 minutes into the race, and this was kind of the race, right? We got a little lucky. We probably had the right sail combinations during the night when others may not have, and that's why we were successful. But Susie, you and I had a little different type of uh, preparation, and we're trying to avoid the big mistake. But here we are on the starting line. Why don't you talk us through our starting our start? Well, I just the, the the communication I think is key, and we just didn't do it. We every other move we talk each other through and, and say, okay, this is what your role is, this is what my role is, and my role right we didn't do that because it was a start. But my role right here is I'm supposed to get the clue out and put it behind the shrouds, and Kenny's role is he's supposed to take that spinker sheet and get it on the winch. And we were so wrapped up in the start, and there's boats around us, and you'll see, you know, everybody's. I'm trying to count down at the same time. You can't hear the audio. But the point is, neither of us did that job and reminded the other one because it's it is a two boat thing, and you're supposed to do your job and remind the other person. And you'll see the clue right here. It doesn't go anywhere back. It all it does is go straight forward, and uh, gets into this nice little hourglass. And uh, yeah, that's that was our start. So it, <laughs> Yeah, it, it went on for about That's 10 more minutes, on. but there's the spin. We, did. we didn't prep because we were so caught up in all the boats around us. Yep. You no, know, so there's uh, Jesse Fielding taking, you know, they had a great start just to lure of us, got through us to lure. Um, yeah. Rob Alexander, close yeah. to weather, he's got a, as big an hourglass as we have, but um, somehow miraculously his came out, ours didn't. And then I think we're going to see the other Figaro three come you know it, it seems now they you're wiped out right in front of you yeah <laughs> there's, a lot, there's like time right now so what are we doing what are we doing we're talking about we have a we don't even know if we have a yeah i didn't get the clue in i didn't i didn't get the clue back and then, wait and there comes there comes the other figaro wiping out in front of us <clears throat> so the other figaro becomes a bit of a roadblock and you're on by the way we're on uh, autopilot at this stage because we're trying to figure out how to get the huge hourglass out of the spinnaker oh they wipe out right in front of us jeez don't even flinch I'm, i think i see them but i'm like ah, I'll miss them. <laughs> we'll be fine. anyway <clears throat> the moral of the story is we did not avoid the big mistake off the line but what we did avoid was blowing the kite up so that was the biggest thing because that's our only full size kite we got it down we unwrapped it got it back up again and got ourselves back up in the game and i can honestly say from then on we didn't have we didn't make a big mistake you know i, I think jesse missed a mark uh the the uh uh the class 40 uh blew a kite up uh rob alexander on the other 3300 they blew two kites up we um you know dragging it in the water we we avoided after this we avoided the big mistake so, so we're not we're not proud of that but but at the same time this is how it's supposed to be this is our practicing and this is, <laughs> this is our new takedown and brad's down below and this is just blowing the tack getting the thing under control getting the foot in and down and having a long enough tack line that you can get the tack line all the way down below and you're not like dragging it 
we changed our tack line lengths dramatically to make sure that we could fly that tack line as far as it needed to go. And, uh, and we practiced this, you know, we practiced it. And by the way, we screwed it up so much that that's how jubilant you <laughs> that get. That was by far the best one we ever did. <laughs> that's the fact that's the one I'm showing. Okay. Uh, here's, here's one we did, uh, Susie and I tried to do during the race. And uh, on the left here, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but that's the mark. And it's like, oh boy, we're already late. So we got it in, in the boat in one piece at this stage. We've already flustered ourselves through the starting, through the start, and we're not going to make another big mistake. So we, we got it down, tack blew off. But again, we weren't prepared, right, Susie? We, we needed to, we didn't have, everything is about preparation. And here's, here we've switched to a letterbox. For those of you who don't understand, the letterbox is through the boom and it's away from the jammers because we actually tore a kite in practice uh, on the jammers. A letterbox, but I, we didn't have what we didn't have the tack. I think the tack line. I I'm, I was probably standing on the tack line, and that's one of those things. It's this boat is still. It's like slippery down below, and you you have to really Susie. think through where you put different stuff. It's an ice skating rink down there. Susie, you're being nice. Kenny forgets either the spinnaker halyard or the tack line every single time. You got like, Keep pulling. Keep pulling. I'm pulling yeah. against a cleated rope. That hurt. That hurts. That truth. The, <laughs> the truth hurts. <laughs> I love having your brother on, you know, he speaks the truth to power, right? He'll never be doing it again, but you just... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we might have enough. Oh, and then heavy air. So, jiving. I mean... For yeah, we had a good, we had a really good light air uh, mode on jiving. <laughs> this is not it. No, hang on a second. I gotta go back. Sorry. Uh, I usually screw this up a couple times of webinar. If I can go back. Maybe I can't. Sorry. This is, well, let's just jump into tacking here for a second. Um, yep. This is something we got pretty good at, but the boat was so set up for this. Watch Go this. Down lured. And this is all Brad, because he's like, hey, this, this is a great way to divide the responsibilities. And I think every team will divide their responsibilities uh -huh. differently, but this boat is set up so easily so the forward person can do the tack and the other the back person releases the runner and then goes through and just, as Kenny always told me, if, if the jib doesn't come in, it's not the it's not the trimmer's fault. It's all the driver's fault. So I it's one of those things. I learned so much from the two of you this summer. It's been it's been a great experience. So tacking tacking became really one of the easiest things we could do. Uh, uh, here, let me try to get back to the jiving. Um, this, heavy, so this is twenty this is twenty twenty plus knots of breeze, <laughs> ripping along. Uh, Two people, you know, jiving in 20 plus knots of breeze with 10 people is hard enough. Two people. So we decided just to flag. This is our flag jive. We decided just to let the halyard out, get the boat onto the new jive. And, and then the sheet. Sorry, let the, the sheet, sheet out. out. Not the halyard, yeah. Let the sheet out, not the halyard. Flag it. Flag yeah. it out front. Drop it, drop it to the head. Yeah, let it go to the head stay and then just start wailing. But you released the, you released the runner. Yep. And then we just get it over and start wailing again. But you can see that the tack of the, I mean, sorry, the clue of the jib. We don't let the jib fly yet. We just kind of center the jib. And then I get a lot of bad air for the kite. So kite, you can actually pull it almost all the way in. Then you, and then I you quickly hit it. it over. Yeah. And I love this because as the helmsman having the spinnaker sheet on my hand, uh, as soon as you ease that jib out, the spinnaker fills and you don't feel like you're going to flip the boat over. I can control the boat. Um, because the spinnaker sheet is in my hand. And, and, I, then, I, I, and then I go straight back up to the runner, because at this point, it's, it's all just about the windswept, I mean, the swept uh, spreaders, because we jibe and basically don't worry about the runners until we go. But then <laughs> Kenny's yelling, get the runner, the mast is gonna fall. Yeah, it was pretty, there's a couple <laughs> pretty of times, so I was surprised, even with the big swept back spreaders, uh, that, that head stay got pretty darn loose. <laughs> so. We shouldn't. We can tell Glenn and and we can tell Glenn and Nick that now. <laughs> he, he's on. He's on the call. Okay, Sorry. Glenn. Sorry. 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 So the, another thing we've done, and we've we've been really uh, diligent about this, is keeping a playbook uh, this summer. So you know, w when we did go practicing, we would update it um, for, for a variety of reasons. One is because Susie was sailing on the boat and Brad was sailing on the boat and we wanted to keep passing the information on. And be consistent uh, and make it consistent between the two of us. Right. And, and it was better for me because 
that consistency helped me at the same time. So, so anyway, this is, there's nothing really to, to look at here specifically, but it's just the fact that keeping a playbook is pretty nice. Um, a lot of the big boats I've sailed on in my life, we had the most incredibly articulate, uh, concise playbooks you could ever imagine. And it allowed new people to fit into, uh, fit into uh, spots that maybe you didn't have permanent members and, it, and it, it would go flawlessly. And then the final part of this was, you know, a lot of these races have, uh, have yellow bricks or others in how much you can learn and how much you can learn by studying the yellow brick at, at the end of the race, where you made your mistakes, where others made mistakes. This one's funny, how many people went home <laughs> early in the race? The uh, smart people. It was when <laughs> you can see when people um, went beyond marks, how many big mistakes were actually made out there and how many mistakes that, um, that, we, that we made. So use this technology and this information as much as possible because it really, it works. It's a big, big help. Um, so, we're moving on out of the specifics. We had some really good questions, you guys, come in from, from the crowd. And I just wanna, I wanna bring you guys in on a couple of these questions. I think we've got a few, we got, we got 10 minutes left. First of all, one of the questions is, and, and by the way, we're using this video here as the backdrop because it's really, it's the only benign uh, double-handed <laughs> sailing I remember doing over this past year. It was usually, excuse my French, a complete shit fight going on. and. Uh, this is some nice downwind sailing. Uh, so this is going to be our nice, uh, our nice benign backdrop as we talk about some of these questions. First one, I think is a really good question. And Brad, um, let, let's, let's put this to you is um, when you're, when you're retrofitting another boat for in this, in this particular case, uh, Richard Albin says they got a far 30 and they've been double handing. But sure enough, FAR 30 sails with six, seven, eight people on board the rail. So all of a sudden they don't have any people on board and the thing's not going very good. So what are your suggestions as to how, to how to make a retrofit, especially a light, somewhat tippy boat like that retrofit and make it work for double-handed sailing? Because this boat, well, this boat's a little lower aspect sail plan and it has water ballast already built in. FAR 30 doesn't have that. Well, I, I think uh, you already hit on it earlier in the webinar is that you go talk to your North sales uh, sail maker and you develop a set of sails that are specific to the boat that can get you a rating advantage. Smaller roach, uh, take, some, take some roach out of the main, sail with smaller jibs um, and make sure you have a prod. Obviously the standard MUM 30 or FAR 30 uh, still had spinnaker poles. Um, go to a prod and start working on um, the right size spinnakers and the right si uh, the right kind of systems. It's the truth. You I, you have to go smaller on the sails because you exactly. can't you can't do it. Um, you can't do it on, on a boat like that. And most boats are made for six, seven, eight, whatever, ten people right. on the rail. So you really got to take that small sail plan thing to heart. Uh, I think that's exactly right. Well, look at the J-105. The J-105 um, that uh, the American, um, the Young American program, they sailed with tiny sails and they finished second in that Ida Lewis distance race with tiny sails on a J-105. So um, let's see. Tapio sends in a, a question saying, um, he wants to modify a, a standard uh, double hand to a, a boat to a, a double handed setup running rigging related equipment in particular is there anything you would do different on wheel steering i would say it's probably just self-steering susie i mean these self-steering systems are unbelievable but you can't you can't skimp on it the better the system the better you're going to have at self-steering the, the thing about the autopilots is that there are there's so many different brands out there and so many different levels that I think you can get into it at whatever price point you can. But anything you put in there, you need to take the time to go out and tune it. Because although we had, a bit, this one has a, a rather simplistic version, even the amount of, uh, just a little story, we used to engage it and it would automatically go five degrees to the right. It's like, okay, so what, what, what are we doing wrong? It, it, it's, it's just like any other instrumentation on the boat. You need to go out, tune it, get all the settings right. And the more money you spend on your autopilot, the more time you're going to have to invest in it. So there is a, a cost 
you know, benefit analysis there to decide which is the right one for you and what your goals are. But without a doubt, um, it is one of the most important additions that you can add to your boat to make self to make double handing actually possible. No question. Uh, you know, we, we hand steered most of that windy race, uh, mainly because whether we didn't have our act together on dialing in the, the, the autopilot or maybe, it, you know, next, the next upgrade higher might, might have worked out. But anyway, we ended up doing a lot of hand steering and I would have given a lot for a better <laughs> autopilot at a second of time. So w one more question here. Uh, uh, symmetrical spinnakers versus asymmetrics. And, and, you know, a lot of the boats that do double-handed racing are on the heavier side. And they probably all live their whole racing life with symmetrical spinnakers. And you know, when do you when do you make that change? Do you go to asymmetrics? And I, I guess part of it, Brad, is if it's if it if it's a lot of short course stuff and that boat handling part of it um, makes a big difference, then the VPP of your boat, how how apparent how apparent wind is created, can you make enough apparent wind? probably has as much to do with whether the decision to, if you're out in the ocean and have long legs. Yeah, you can have a symmetrical spinnaker. That would be fine. Right. If you've got a jibe, you know, once Ten a day times. or once <laughs> every couple of days, that's a, that's a different story. But if you've got to do a lot of boat handling and, and you're around coasts and things like that, I think you got to really think on a heavier boat, you got to think about, you got to think about asymmetrics, don't you think? I think so. And, you know, you are limited when you're in, on a heavy boat like I'm on now. I mean, 26,000 pounds doesn't bring the apparent wind forward very quickly. You don't ever even come close to breaking free. Um, the rating system will pick that up. You have to commit to the easy handling scenario over the best speed scenario. Hey, who knows? You might get good at going wing and wing in flat water with your asymmetrical. You get good at that. That's a technique. It's not easy, but you can do it. You can do it um, and, and kind of get low by going wing and wing with your asymmetrical. J, plenty of J-boats to it. Um, and I think that's, you're going to get yourself into trouble if you have to jive a lot with, with a standard lazy guy, lazy sheet program. So Susie, there's a lot of, uh, with, this, with this Olympics, uh, this Olympic thing, certainly shining a bright light on, on the double-handed um, group right now. 2024, mixed gender, um, female, male. So let's, throwing you in the, in the fe our, our token female of the three of us uh, bracket. What would you say to a young up and comer, a, a laser radial sailor, a 470 sailor? What would, you, what would you say to a young up and comer as to what your priorities are versus maybe somebody who's been a few miles? What are, their, what, you know, what are the priorities of, of each of the age groups and how do, you get, how do you think you get involved in a double-handed program? Well, I, the thing about, about this program is it's a lot different from other Olympic type programs because you can't just go out and buy yourself a laser and start competing and, and even though that's a very expensive way to go too because you need the, the coaching but this has this big piece of hardware here and I think that you just have to be proactive if you don't already have your own boat you just have to go out there and not only learn everything you can um, learn the skills you don't have but you have to be a really well-rounded sailor you you can't just come in and say okay well I'm I'm actually a great head sole trimmer that's that's great but the ability to get on any boat be comfortable getting out there and learning all the things you don't know. Um, just, you really have to be a self-starter and it's, it's going to be more than any other program because there really isn't that much around. You will find um, in your own local areas, there's, there are programs out there, the Young American program, we talked about that. Oak Cliff is a great resource in Long Island. There are West Coast programs. And if you don't have a boat yourself, you're going to have to go out and do it. Um, the difference between young and old, um, I have to say, I think that, I, this might be sexist, I'm sorry, but I think women are really um, well suited to offshore sailing. I mean, we're even being a mom, like the patience of like dealing with kids and, and sleep deprivation and a lot of things, the skills that you just take for granted as being 
a mom, they can't, they come in to help for me. Um, I, I am, I just, I can do the same thing over and over and over a pep repetition of it. It's one of those things that I think sometimes we don't get credit for, or you don't see in yourself as being a strength that can really be a strength in offshore sailing. So you just have to take the initiative, go and find out what our programs there are. Cause nobody's going to, I mean, I'm unique. Uh, Kenny came and asked me, but I don't think a lot of girls are going to get asked just because they want it. They have to go out and really make it happen for themselves. Right. Oh, that's a great, that's a great final comment. And by the way, you know, here in America, we got a few little groups, but you know, you look at the offshore academies in France and England, mm -hmm. Australia, New Zealand, you know, the real sailing, the real, real big sailing groups out there. And I'm sure we have some people listening from all those countries. We realize here in the States, kind of how far behind we are. We are you know, behind. This offshore sailing academy in France is the real deal. And, uh, and the training, male or female, is just phenomenal. So, uh, you know, th there, are some, there are some countries who have been taking this quite seriously for a long time. And, and it's very and we, and, we, and we do have a lot of catching up to do, but I think that because it's becoming so popular here, hopefully that those gaps will get filled. And this was just such a strange summer because I think there was a lot of planning that was going on and it's kind of uh, made it a little different, but I think that there are going to be opportunities that do show up. It just needs to be, it's just kind of unsettled right now, but I, I it, we are behind the, behind on the curve, but I don't think that means that we're, that we're not going to be successful in the long run. It just means we have a, a, a steeper, steeper cliff to climb. Well, you guys, I have, uh, we're, our hour is up. Um, I got one final comment, and this is something uh, as it relates to you two guys and then to several others who helped in our program. But uh, if you think, my, my final word of advice is if you think double handing is about two people, you're, you're radically wrong. Um, in fact, I don't, to, to train double handed sailing, I don't see leaving the dock with only two people on the boat ever. I mean, you need, you need resources and you need to have a, a larger group of friends who can help out. Um, Melissa Santanello and everything she did on the shore side for us. Uh, um, Glenn came out sailing with us all the time. Having two or three or four people, well, let's say two people extra on board the boat in order to get sit, remember, most of the stuff that you're trying to accomplish is data driven. You're trying to figure out how to trim sales better, how to get sales up and down. You can move everybody aside for a few minutes, but getting in it, for example, leaving the dock, you know, when Brad and I left the dock to do our race, the, the solo twin, um, we had JJ on board, Porter Cavalli, um, and he came out with us and helped us kind of sort the boat out and get it organized and then hopped off with 10 minutes to go. You see Charlie Enright doing his double-handed uh, deal on, on, um, on 11th hour racing. They never go out to the starting line with just two people. So don't be afraid to bring some resources uh, along with you to help, whether you're training or whether you're just getting ready for a race. If there's an extra body that you can toss off on a rubber boat, then for sure do it because I think it really made our uh, experience better because we had, we had more people involved to help out. Um, anyway, final, final thoughts from the two of you? Yeah, we just watched you texting and driving. <laughs> getting, uh, That's Melissa. I have a video of him like having a chat with Melissa. It was awesome. It was so well, romantic. Our navigator just couldn't get the weather off, so I had to help her out. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, Don't a, go there. That's harsh. No, it's it's been it's been oh, yeah, it's he's been trying to get a signal. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get the signal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Easy final thoughts. I just I have to say it was it's been so much fun to learn a new discipline of sailing. I had no idea that when I saw those other double handed people out there, I did. I thought they were a little bit wacky. And now I'm a complete convert and I love being able to take on new roles and learn new things. It always makes me happy. And taking this boat from zero and doing all the data, that that appeals to my my engineering geeky side. So it's got all all the benefits. Well, uh, thank you again to uh, Nick. Um, and, and all the people at Genoa North America, uh, and to Glenn um, at Blue Nose and his whole team there, Dave and Andrew and all, all those folks. 
uh, and, and all the troops in North Sales, of course, that I couldn't get through a day without. Um, this has been really fun. Hopefully it's just the beginning. Hopefully we got a long ways to go. Hopefully we're gonna be doing this for a while. To all of you out there who knew about double-handed sailing long before we did, I wish you had spoken louder, but you probably did and we weren't listening anyway. Um, we, we enjoy your part of the sport like I never thought in a million years and um, can't wait to do it more and more. If you have questions, uh, please uh, get in touch with us. Uh, we will answer your questions. We're hooked. Uh, we, are, we are fully, fully hooked. And uh, yeah, get in touch with us and we will, we will help. And I have one more final comment. So we all, we, uh, we talked about how bad the start was to our race that Susie and I just had the Ida Lewis race and how that was our one big mistake. And one of the really sad parts was, is I lost my, this is a three-year-old, unbelievably faded, disgusting, I have to admit, disgusting North Sales hat that went flying off my head as I ran forward to try to get the spinnaker on deck and out of the water so we didn't blow it up. So this goes flying off of my head and quite frankly, a little pitter patter. I, I was gonna start to cry, not because we were screwing up the race, but it was because my hat didn't fit my head perfectly, uh, flew off, flew off um, d during that shit fight in the beginning of the race. So we come in the next day um, very successfully, had a great race. Susie and I, I think we sailed really, really well. We win the race, we come in, the following day, we go back down to clean the boat out as proper as you do as a proper crew. And we show up at the boat and the hat that went flying off my head right off the starting line is sitting on top of the winch on Alchemist out in front of the Moorings restaurant here in Newport. So whoever this was, first of all, I thank you. There was no note, no nothing. I thank you. This was, this was, uh, it was hilarious, first of all. And I don't know how we're gonna do this, but I, I don't know, there's, there's gotta be some sort of reward, but, the, but by, by offering a reward, you, you're gonna have to, to get the reward, you're gonna have to give me a couple distinguishing features of this hat. And there, the, the hat does have a couple of distinguished features. So, so um, let me know who this was, because I owe you one big time, I have it back. Uh, it will be used again. It is a very lucky hat, and thank you very much. So another part of the great, the, of the double-handed lore. Anyway, Brad, Susie, you guys are troopers. Brad, thanks for taking some time out on your, uh, on your cruise. Say hi to Kara. Enjoy yourselves well, double-handing your boat around. Go the Bruins. Bruins. Go Bruins. <laughs> and uh, Susie, you're a star. It's been a blast to get to know you through this whole thing that much better. Uh, uh, none of this, none of the success would have happened without you and your and your commitment to it. So I thank you uh, very, very much. Well, you're welcome. Thanks, Kenny. Thank thanks you. for having us. Thanks so from all of us at North Sales, uh, thank you for thanks for joining us for this hour. Um, have a great night. Have a great morning. Have a great day. And we can't wait to see you all back out on, on the water. Hopefully, when the COVID world is in our past, uh, we get to do we get to see each other that much more and have that much more fun on the water. Take care, be safe, and uh, we'll see you in the very near future.